Harvard Divinity School. Music, Voice, and Healing, a conversation with Grace Nono, March 8th, 2023. Good afternoon and welcome to our Nosiologies event. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani and I'm the host of the series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative at the CSWR here at Harvard Divinity School. This series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational. Traditionally referred to as noses in Western philosophical and religious traditions, and often understood in contraposition to science, these ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture, and academic research. What is this place of spirit possession, divination, and experiences perceived as out of the ordinary in our lives? How can we study and approach this type of phenomena? Going beyond dichotomies such as body and mind, ordinary and extraordinary, reason and experience and matter and spirit. This series hosts scholars of different disciplines and practitioners interested in exploring and expanding the boundaries of what counts as knowledge today. Before introducing today's guest one announcement, the Q&A feature over Zoom is activated. Therefore, you can type there your questions for our guests throughout our conversation, and I will try to ask them on your behalf if time allows. It goes without saying that if you have questions for us after the event, you can reach out to me by email and I will share them with Dr. Nono. You can find my email address in the chat or on the CSWR and HDS websites. So today um, I have the honor and privilege to ha have here with me Dr. Grace Nono. Dr. Grace Nono is an ethnomusicologist music performing artist and cultural worker. Among her publications are The Baba Lansing Back, Philippine Shamans and Voice, Gender and Place, Song of the Baba Lan, Living Voices, Medicines, Spiritualities of the Philippine Ritualist, Oralist, Healers, and The Shared Voice, Chanted and Spoken Narratives from the Philippines. As performing artist, Grace is a singer who specializes in the performance of a number of oral songs taught to her by mostly elders, Mindanao, Visayas, and Luzon in the Philippines' three major island clusters. As cultural worker, Grace founded the Tao Foundation for Culture and Arts, a Philippine nonprofit organization that has been engaged in cultural regeneration initiatives for almost three decades. She has also begun co-producing documentary films, including Sacred Voices, Sacred Lands, and Wisdom Keepers of the Earth. So thank you very, very much, Grace, for being here. We're honored to have you back because uh, you spent some time here at the CSWR in the past, right? Thank you, Giovanna. Hello, hello, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you for this invitation. Um, I don't know how Wonderful. you found me, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, I was not at the CSWR when you spent your last period here because I was doing field work, but, um, but I follow the activities obviously. And I have a student actually who is very, um, she has Filipino origins and she was very fan of your work and we read together one of your books so that's why I fell in love with you and your work so oh, thank, thank you. you for being here thank you so much so how did you become a singer and um, have there been changes in the repertoire do you want to share a bit about your story yes um Giovanna before I answer your question may i uh offer a little bit of a, a prayer yes um, i would like to pay my respects to the creator to the earth that hosts us to our ancestors and other guides and to my collaborators through the years many of whom are no longer with us but who may be mentioned during the presentation and discussions I apologize in advance for whatever mistakes I may have. Please know that our intention here is good. 
that is to contribute to mutual respect and understanding amongst peoples. May it be so. May it be so. Now, thank you. Now to your question, how did I become a singer? And have there been changes in my repertoire? Well, Giovanna, I grew up like most Filipinos in my generation in the wake of over three centuries of colonization by Spain and the United States and ongoing cultural domination by the West North. Okay, so um, do you see that? That was my yep. childhood. Yeah, those are my parents, my mother and my father uh, during my elementary graduation. So um, just like almost everybody else, I mimicked Western and Westernized songs, which I loved and continue to love. My mother was an English and mathematics teacher who taught me old American tunes from a beat up hardbound book that she had, songs like Whispering Hope from 1868 and an English version of the Neapolitan song, O Soli Mio. You, of course, you know this Giovanna, right? But <laughs> not the one that Elvis sang, okay? It was a different version. <laughs> My father, on the other hand, mostly sang to me Hispanized folk songs in the vernacular languages of Ilocano and Visayan. We have over 100 languages in the Philippines. Um, I listened to popular songs on the radio. Um, when I entered high school, we were immersed in European art music and Filipino compositions in the neoclassical style. Then in college, I was introduced to American folk tunes by Bob Dylan and his cohort, American st uh, jazz standards, punk counterculture music, and performance sound art. All these constituted for me the full range of music in the world. Not once were we told that there were such things as non-Western musics, including those of our ancestors. But you know, that's what colonialism does. It attempts to destroy people's sense of self, history, memory, culture, replacing these with the colonizers deemed superior. Now, after college, I accidentally heard a native oral chant during a chance encounter with an, a native mother in the mountains that connected our province with two others. When I heard it, I could not place the sound in anything that I had heard in my entire life, yet I was captivated by it. Hearing it also made me confused why voices like these have been suppressed from being heard by my generation and perhaps from generations before ours. So I would spend the next decades of my life finding ways to listen, to understand, and with the permission of a number of oral singers learned to sing some of these songs. My research about orality and decolonization helped me make sense of what I was doing. Now, when I became a professional singer, one second, when I became a professional singer, I tried to learn a whole concert repertoire of these oral songs that were taught to me by indigenous, native Christian, and native Muslim mentors. Here are some of my um, mentors. Do you see this picture? Do you see the slide? That is uh, Dr. Minkitai, one of my teachers. This is Mandung on the extreme right. These are my teachers who have well-loved um, mentors. It's Tarsi Manandao. That is uh, by Angela Placido. And this is uh, Ralph Valle, who, who, who taught me a more Hispanized um, uh, genre. Um, all right. Um, learning to sing the songs from these mentors was not easy because I did not grow up listening to them and I don't speak the languages that they are sung in. You know, it's one thing to learn the melodies and the words. It's a whole other matter to be able to improvise and let alone to sing in ways that express spirit. I've been performing this repertoire almost exclusively for the last 28 years, together with indigenous Muslim and Christian collaborators. Here are um, photos of some of our performances. This is together with my teacher right beside me, Mandung. Um, that's in a gathering of uh, ritualists in our own backyard. 
that is uh, in the northern mountains. This is this was with my um, fellow musicians in a concert in Japan. This was in Germany. This was in New York. In Sarawak, in Borneo. This was in the Philippines. In Thailand. In the Philippines. Yeah. All right. So that was that has been my life. Wonderful. Wonderful. And then how did you transition from being then a full-time performing artist to being a scholar? Good what question. Happened? What happened, right? Well, <laughs> you, you know, Giovanna, I was always a singer with an academic background. Becoming a singer was a big surprise and not a pleasant one for my family, especially my mother who could not understand why her daughter who she sent to the best schools would forgo having a stable academic career to become a singer under unstable conditions despite achieving success. Well, my mother did send me to art school. So why was she surprised, right? Um, looking back, looking back, becoming a singer was one of the greatest accidents of my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not only has it allowed me self-expression, it has given me intimate access to embodied knowledge that I may not obtain by solely reading books. Focusing on subjugated repertoires, seldom found or captured in literature, and when they are, they, are often, they often appear in reified ways, has also helped raise awareness about cultural expressions that colonial and new colonial forces have disqualified, silenced, suppressed, rendered unintelligible, actively produced as non-existent by labeling them ignorant, irrational, backward, inferior, local, parochial, and non-productive to pursue. And I am citing Bonaventura de Sousa Santos here. So why did I start writing books? I did it because although singing has been a most profound um, gift in my life, it has not been able to express everything that I have wanted to say. I began writing in earnest when I went back to school to get my graduate degrees. I knew that many of the problems we face stem from the new colonial education that we have received. So I chose to acquire some fluency and the modes of thinking that I knew I must challenge and critique while generously acknowledging whatever deserves appreciation. So let me share with you. Um, this is this was my first um, book, The Shared Voice, Chanted and Spoken Narratives in the Philippines. The focus of this was more methodological. I needed to, to know how I could obtain knowledge not by reading books. How do I get to the to the elders whose knowledges are not in libraries, right? Because it, it has mostly been the, the colonizers and the, the colonized elites who have, you know, published materials about, about just about everything. So how do I, how do I learn from people who operate in a different knowledge economy? So that is, that, this is what this book is all about. And once I had a way to, um, to learn even you know, without reading tons of books, it's like the door started to open and I could already have a little bit of access, okay? So that was the first book. Um, the second one- and The audience saw... can see why I love you and your work. I, I saw some comments. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing this. <laughs> And this is the second book, um, Song of the Babylon. I think this was probably what you read. And this was really, you know, engaging deeply with uh, a number. You, we have, you have to say a number because there's plenty. And, you know, how much can you contain in a book? Not very much. Um, ritual specialists from different uh, parts of the Philippines. Again, indigenous, native Christian and native Muslim. So there are uh, there are many differences, you know, among these practitioners. Um, so this is what this book tries to contain. 
All right, and the latest one, um, Babay Lansing back, Philippine Shamans and Voice, Gender and Place. This one is more now in conversation with theories, yeah, theories of the Babaylan, theories of voice, sex and gender, and place. Um, so it's more, um, may, you can say maybe transnational in, in approach. You know, I'm not just, my audience here is not only my people, but, um, you know, also people in the Western world. And uh, the one on the left is, uh, it's the same book, but the one on the left was the, the Cordell edition and the, 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 the one on the right is by Ateneo University Press, just came out. Okay, so- well, Congratulations. Um, thank you. Can I ask you, I mean, I mean um, maybe not all of us are uh, acquainted. Can you tell us who are the Babylons and how you got interested into them, because I think Babylon keeps coming up as a word, but maybe we need some unpacking here. <laughs> Thank you, Giovanna. Um, well, allow me to invite everybody to get a copy of Babylon Sing Back. Um, in this book, I explain why the term Babaylan, while useful as a shorthand, is imprecise, not only because it does not begin to capture the heterogeneity of ritual specialization in the Philippines, it also imposes one ritual specialist identity over others, which can be termed an instance of internal colonialism. A more appropriate way is to use the specific local title of each practitioner. And this is what I tried to do in the book's three chapters. Now to your question, analogous to my story of not being made to hear non-Western musics when I was growing up, I also never heard any mention of the terms Babaylan or Bailan or any other rich, ritual specialist name during the entirety of my childhood. Okay, and this was Mindanao, which is known for its, its rich cultural traditions. Religion to us meant Catholicism and Protestantism. Music meant Westernized Western and Westernized popular and classical music. Medicine meant allopathic medicine. Education meant, meant that which transpired within the classroom. That was the totality of the, more or less the totality of the reality that is revealed to us. The thing about me, however, is besides being drawn to singing because my parents and almost everyone around me sang, was at an early age, I knew that I wanted to become a priest. Not a nun, but a priest. On the day of my elementary school graduation, I approached our parish priest to share with him my aspiration. And guess what happened? What did they say? <laughs> yeah, what did they say? <laughs> he effectively quashed my desire by telling me that this was not possible because not only am I a girl, I am a Catholic girl, and the tradition in Catholicism dictates that a girl cannot become a priest. I offered an immediate rebuttal. I was probably 11. I said, but father, tradition can be broken. Well, I only got a stern gaze in response to my words. So that made me think how foolish I have been for even thinking priesthood was available for a girl like me. So I went on to high school and came across a Philippine history book that cited women priestesses called in the book Babaylan during the Philippines pre-colonial and early colonial periods. These priestesses were reported to have fought against the Spanish and American invaders in order to preserve indigenous ways. And they were accordingly exterminated by the colonizers. Upon reading this, my thwarted desire for priesthood shifted to a fascination with this indigenous tradition that accorded spiritual leadership to women. Repeating some of what I said earlier, some years after I graduated from college, I had an unexpected encounter also with a living bailan or ritual specialist among the Atamanobo in that area. I could not believe that this was happening to me because I thought this bailan or babailan have all disappeared. This encounter by, the, encounter, by the way, took place exactly 32 years ago. I kept, you know, 
when I was face to face with this bailan, I kept my bewilderment to myself. His name was Lako, a tall, slender man with deep voice and dark eyes, his countenance more recessed than that of the convivial datu or chief who warmly welcomed the group of literacy teachers I was traveling with. When we went uh, downhill to the next village where we were to spend the evening, that was when I heard the oral chant for the first time as sung by the Atamanobo a mother named Bansui, whose lilting voice moved me very deeply. Traveling back to the lowlands, I felt inspired but confused. What conspiracy was this that was suppressing the historical presence of the Bailan and Babailan and who knows who else? I would spend the next decades finding ways to meet and listen to the voices of ritual specialists, many of whom are oral singers. 16 years and several ritual specialist encounters later, I found myself at the edge of the back of a motorcycle, hugging my 78 year old mother in front of me as we moved along an old winding logging road toward the innermost parts of our home province, Agusan del Sur. We tried to keep our balance as the driver swerved or obstinately moved forward in response to the challenges posed by the slippery ditches and mud pools. Awaiting us at our destination was an event that many Filipinos like ourselves do not believe to happen in the modern age, a ritual officiated by a bailan. Practices like these have been widely thought to have perished during the Spanish and American colonial periods, a notion welcomed by those who see indigenous pre-Christian and pre-Islamic practices labeled paganism by the orthodoxies that have tried to eradicate or convert native populations as at best a deficient and at worst a road to hell. Such view is equally embraced by agents of the modern nation who have relegated such practices to the past or to the realm of ignorance and superstition. In contrast to these detractors are those who lament the alleged disappearance of these traditions, particularly the women priests who led them, who have since become idealized as proto-feminists and or as land-based symbols of anti-colonial resistance. Both camps generally agree, however, that the woman my mother and I were about to meet either no longer exists or exists without a voice to make a difference. My mother struggled to stay stable on the seat in front of me. I kept stopping her aged body from lilting as the fragile vehicle bumped and swayed. Raised during the middle years of the American colonial period when indigenous ways were actively suppressed following similar campaigns by the Spanish, she too grew up unaware of ritual specialists as well as indigenous songs. It was only a year after this trip when she found out that not only have there been an oralist, you know, an oralist uh, performing performer cousin of hers, there have also been Mamuhat Buhat ritual specialists among her aunts and uncles in Kamigin Island, where she comes, where she came from. Seven years after her death, her own ethno-linguistic group, Kamigingnon, was declared, this was just in 19, 2019, was declared among the Philippines' indigenous cultural communities. To sum up, my answer to your question is I got interested in what is known as Babaylan because ever since I was a little girl, I've been interested in matters of spirit, in songs, and in the recovery of our identities and ways that were subjugated through five centuries of colonial and neocolonial domination. And when I saw how ritual specialists' experiences and understandings of themselves complicated or contested much of what had been written and taught about them, I resolved to help rectify the situation by helping to get ritual specialists' voices heard. I hope I answered your question, Giovanna. No, fantastic. I mean, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask you, according to Philippine ritual specialists, you know, and this is also to uh, respond to Emily's question, what is the relationship between music, voice, and healing? Emily writes, for example, I believe in music as medicine. Do you think that music can serve as healing for those grieving the loss of loved ones, for example? I mean, what's, yeah. Do you want to say more about music, voice, and healing within sure. the, thanks. Sure, I will first answer that in relation to the ritual specialists. Um, thanks. 
first of all, music is an English term that carries a lot of baggage, you know, as man-made, as bounded object that can, whose elements can be dissected as harmony, as written or printed, as composed before it is performed, etc. All these could be reifying and misleading when applied to the oral expressions of other peoples. The term needs to be decolonized by decentering its hegemonic associations with the meanings, by the meanings used by the once and currently colonized peoples who may deploy the same term in their own ways and for their own purposes. To the extent that we can consider the songs and chants that many Philippine ritualists sing and listen to as music, here's how some of them, who I wrote about in my second book, describe the relationships between their vocal expressions and healing. I have outlined overlapping functions that these songs serve. First, um, as praise, as praises to deity. Among the Cebuanos in um, Central Philippines, the Sinuog song, Sinulog, some people call it Sinulog, but my, my um, interlocutor, who had already passed the revered um, Inday, Inday Titang Diola. Uh, she called it Sinuog. According to her, the Sinuog songs, um, which are sung alongside dances, drum beats, prayers, acrobatics, and theatrical presentations, are praises and expressions of devotion to the Senor Santo Nino, the Holy Child Jesus. Performed to fulfill vows and to celebrate the Senor, they act as pleas to the deity to provide for people's needs. Quite a number of healing miracles have taken place through the Sinog, according to um, Inditang, uh, the late Inditang. She had passed, and her fellow uh, Marino were Sinog uh, devo devotees. Similarly, among the, okay, so you, you have the picture of Sinuog, yeah? Similarly, um, among the Manunubli of Batangas, that was Central Philippines earlier, now we're going uh, to Southern Luzon. Uh, the Subli songs, according to several Batangas Tagalog Manunubli, led by their Matre Mayo or leader, the late Camila Makimot. These songs are praises to the Mahal na Poon, or the Holy Cross of Bawan, and are performed together with dances and prayers that are part of the Subli ritual. The Subli songs honor and express devotion to the Mahal na Poon and renew vows to her. Kasami, a devotee, however, is clear to say that the singing and the dancing themselves are not the direct causes of healing. For these devotees believe that it is the Mahal Napuun, the deity, who heals. As for the Manunubli, when they perform the Subli for the Mahal Napuun, they, they can attest that their own body aches have disappeared, their worries and heart aches have diminished, they have regained health and lightness of being. So that's um, song as. Uh, calls to the deity now mm -hmm. this one or oh, a praise to the deity this one is a call and appeal to spirits to come and help okay um among the ibaloy in benguet the badiw chant according to the late ibaloy mambulong the one in the picture uh kahen estakio and his daughter mana estakio the badiw chant is the customary way to appeal to the creator Kabunian during the Kanyao feast performed to heal the sick and to bless the ritual participants. Now among the among the um, Ibanag in Cagayan province, the Mangurug, according to the late Ibanag nun, Sister Rosario Batu, who is in the uh, slide, one of the slides, is uh, the, the Mangurug is a native Ibanag adaptation of the Catholic's Apostles' Creed. Mangurug is known to be sung on different occasions, including when someone is sick and a close relative of the patient stands by a window at night to sing the Mangurug, to pray for healing, and the whole village 
sings along. Okay, so next mm -hmm. is song and chant as, um, okay. Did you see this? That is Sister Rosario. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, Manang Lita Anzia. She's the medium here. You know, we, we were singing the Mangurug because that's what you do and to prepare for the deity to, to the spirit to come. And this is when uh, she has come. It's a female um, deity. And look, she is um, working on the legs of another woman. Uh, okay, the third is voice, chant, and song as the voice of spirit heard through the medium. Okay. Um, among the Maguindanao of Sultan Kudarat and Cotabato City, city the Daging, according to the late Maguindanao and Patutunong Bago Samida, Babo Samida Tato, as well as Patutunong Faisal Monal, the Daging is known to be the Tunong or the spirit's voice as it speaks with a tune as those singing. In the same way that when the Tunong or the spirit walks, it is by dancing the Sagayan. The Daging or spirit's voice is heard during rites like the Kapagipat and Kanguana performed to fulfill human obligations to the spirit world and to bring about healing and reconciliation between humans and spirits. Okay, the fourth use function is chant and song as a way to confront the inflictor. Um, among the South Kalinga in Kalinga province, the Dawak, according to the late Kalinga and the Dawak Aragoy Tumapang and her son Ernesto Tumapang, is chanted during the healing rite songa to confront one on one the cause of a person's illness. Through the Dawak, the ritual specialist under the ritual specialist or under Dawak, often a female, negotiates with the spirits for the healing of the sick. She fights those that have captured the persons or the sick person's kalidonba or soul that have caused the illness and commands them, these spirits, to flee while summoning the cap captured soul to return. Okay, so that's uh, Inang Aragoy on the left. And the fifth, um, the fifth uh, function of song that I, that I saw from this uh, my conversations with these ritual specialists is as thanksgiving and payment for healing. Um, among the Kamigingnon in Kamigin Island, a Dalit, according to the late Mamuhat Buhat or Merico Francisco Nong Cabeza Awitin and his daughter Cheche Awitin, Dalit is a gift or offering that may take the form of a song that the Mamuhat Buhat or ritual specialist sings to the spirits at the end of his ritual or her ritual to make the spirits happy so that they will heal his patient, her patient. The Dalit may also take the form of the Charleston dance if it is what the spirits request for. These spirits may then tell the ritualist, don't worry, friend, your, your patient will get well. There are also times when the Stumanod or the spirit asks the patient to sing a song as payment to the spirit that it offended and that caused the ailment. In other words, a song in exchange for the healing. Now, these are just some of the different overlapping functions of song and chant in the work of a few ritual specialists in different parts of the Philippines. Always, the songs and the chants are performed in the context of relationships between humans and spirits, relationships that are believed to impact on people's health. So it is not, you do not extract the, the song or the music and let, you know, and, and attribute the healing to that. No, this has to happen within that whole dy the dynamic, the relationship between humans and humans, humans and spirit, spirit and spirit because the ritual specialist has it has his or her own um 
helpers that negotiate with other spirits. All right. That's fantastic. I mean, I think we we, we will have maybe time um, to talk, uh, to speak again about this aspect of relationship through music and voice with other than humans and among other than humans uh, beings. But I really would like to, since I'm an anthropologist, I'm an ethnographer like you, I am um, very curious to um, know about your methods to navigate in ethnographic and autoethnographic work because in the song of the babylon i think you beautiful uh dovetail you know personal experience and uh your your research and so i was wondering how was this autoethnographic and ethnographic work of yours and methods how they were received by your supervisors um how do you inhabit the role of the researcher? Okay. Okay, so you are, let's talk about how my, my dissertation committee, for example, you know, how they received my, my, my kind of writing, especially my first two books, mm -hmm. yeah? So my, my, my huh. advisor, yeah? Is that what you're asking about? Yes, yes, yes. yes I'm, yes, I'm curious yes. about, you know, commenting on your methods sure, and how sure. well were received. Yeah, so my my advisor, the musicologist Suzanne Cusick, she wrote about my first two books as, and I quote, written intentionally in a clear style that deflects the authority of her authorial voice so as to grant full authority to the voices of the singers themselves. These books can be read as instances of what academics call performative writing, that is writing meant to enact the power relationships it means to describe in these first two books, the power relationship Dr. Nono and Acts with the shamanic singers represented uh, represented is one of the is one of mutual respect between a university educated scholar and singers who, though often just barely literate, carry many generations of orally trans transmitted erudition in their words and in the sounds that their embodied voices know how to make. OK, so that is how she saw my previous two books. Now, with a dissertation, um, one of our, my committee members, Tommy A. Han, the uh, performance ethnology scholar, she commented during our um, defense. She said, and I quote, I would like to rally with you and say that one of the most powerful things you can do, even if you only do it in a few condensed pages, is you talk about yourself as a mediator a person who has a foot in two places. We need to. We need you to tell us who you are and let us know that you will be leading us through this voyage. That would be a deeply political move. It's not navel gazing. Please honor this work by stating very clearly who you are. Your voice is another pillar along with individuals about whom you write. I would run with the idea of you as scholar medium, meaning while you are not a Babylon, you are in many ways a metaphoric scholar medium, one who conveys information to us from the Babylon's word, world, end quote. Now, Tomie is on point that fully divulging one's identity and social location as scholar is crucial as it will help explain the cultural orientation, the values, concepts, theories, language biases, and structures of power embedded in one's text. Now, in the field of indigenous science, uh, Apila Colorado writes, inquiry is understood as they quote as the quote, pursuit of the scholar's voice as one that is embodied, connected with community and anchored in ancestry. Unlike traditional modernist um, research that tends to require dissociating one's personal context from the inquiry process, indigenous science anticipates the scholar's full integration into the inquiry. Truth is not reified as a thing outside of oneself, but relates directly to the experience of the person, end quote. To sum up my answer, I got into research, not necessarily because I wanted to become an academic, which was expected of me and which I have recently accepted and began to fulfill. Expectation of my mother. I became a researcher and scholar first and foremost because I had burning questions about what it means to be Filipino and Mindanawan of Southern and Northern parentage in the wake of 500 years of colonial and ongoing new colonial histories that I may participate in. 
I had burning questions about what it means to be a singer called to priesthood that isn't available for me. I had burning questions about what it means to be a woman, a third world woman of color and a mother to an equally headstrong daughter. That's my beloved. Um, in a patriarchal, racist, and capitalist world, my writing documents and shares with others my ongoing search for answers and has, of course, answers that have, of course, led to more questions. That's my answer. I hope. Oh, that's I one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, just You're a welcome. couple of other questions before moving. Um, the, yeah, the photo is beautiful. Uh, thank you for sharing. Before moving, maybe to um, the questions from the audience. So how the Babylon community reacted to uh, your work as an ethnographer and as a performer? And do you have any stories you want to share with us about your mentors and interlocutors? I like stories. Um, so I don't know, do you have anything to share with us? Let's see. Let's see if I, if I have stories uh, to, to respond to this one. Well, um, resp um, reception, you cannot please everyone, regardless if you are coming from the inside or the outside, especially if you are promoting matters that many indigenous peoples themselves have also come to demonize, like those pertaining to ritual, native rituals, because we have all been made to believe that our ancestors were demons. And the only way that we can be saved is by severing our ancestral ties and by embracing the colonizers' ways. I have found, however, that if one writes in a multivocal manner and tries one's best to give justice to conflicting voices within the text, then it's possible that um, your text can find resonance among different quarters in communities. You also cannot please everyone, especially where there are power struggles, which many communities have plenty of. And if your work becomes challenged because of internal rivalries, for example, in the end, it is your history of good relationships with your research partners in the communities that will help you. If your partners know in their hearts that you have been a positive presence in their lives, they who the law dictates are the ones who should make decisions for themselves. They will be the ones who will fight for your collaborative work to continue. As for my singing, I have generally received, at least from my mentors, who I am accountable to, positive feedback. In a recent visit to uh, my chant mentor, um, Dato Migitay Victorino Sawai, he said in Visayan, that I translate to English, and I quote, from the time I taught you the song Pangulawi 20 years ago, your performance has evolved and grown. Now you're able to emphasize feelings that are necessary to touch and move audiences who do not understand the language in which you sing and quote wonderful now what i ask wonderful. him yes affirming i ask him but why did you teach me the song pangulawit when i do not come from your ethno-linguistic group isn't this cultural appropriation his response in visayan that i translated to english he said and I quote, I taught you Pangulawit, that is a song under the Salah genre, because you wanted to learn. Here, no younger person sings this Salah genre anymore. It makes your heart ache. But why will you feed a person food that he or she does not wish to eat? You, on the other hand, he said, it was as if you were thirsty and famished. You saw singing as nourishment for your spirit. The song, therefore, had to be shared with you. By sharing, I also broadened my knowledge because I was able to extend it over to you instead of being trapped inside me. I feel encouraged as a teacher, especially because we are in cultural education and cult the culture we espouse is not one that is tribalistic and parochial. The principle behind chanting, for example, is universal. When you sing Pangulawit and you are able to touch on the song's implications on the land, the air, the water, tradition, past, future, it's as though you are expressing the spirit that animates our world. You can convey the message of nature through song to the whole universe, end quote. He's a wise guy. I'm so, I'm so grateful that he has taught me in more ways than one, more than just, you know, the song. 
Now, more about cultural appropriation. Do we have time? Well, I mean, we have many questions for the audience. I also would like, if you want to talk more about your cultural worker world, your activism um, work, sorry. Um, so what do you want? I mean, we have 10 minutes left. We have lots okay. of things to say, lots of questions for the audience. How do you feel about it? Do you want to tell us a bit about your, what you do besides write and sing? Sure. And then we move to. Sure, okay. Thanks. I'll do that. Okay, so besides writing and singing, I have also been running these last three decades a nonprofit organization that humbly contributes to cultural revitalization. Here's some of what we do. Um, oh, there was a video that I wanted to show you about. Can we just backtrack a bit? Um, uh, maybe. Maybe there's no more time. Okay, that's all right. We'll just move on to, to our cultural work. Do you see this? Um, we just yes. finished uh, a week ago or a week and a half ago, our 2023 webinar series for music and dance, music and movement, okay? So this is a, a, a lute, a two string lute that was found in, you know, all over the Philippines or not all over, but in different areas in North, Central and Southern Philippines. But now it is mostly found in Mindanao and in Palawan. And this is uh, the master, uh, Karatuan Kalanduyan, our, our, our students from different places, some of them already, already um, prominent uh, musicians. This is uh, a student, Teresa. Uh, this is how it sounds. Okay, so uh, let's move on. This is the gongs. Uh, this is a Guru Agamayo Butokan and our students, and this is how it sounds. <laughs> okay, this is a dance, um, dance class, and this is a narrative song class. So that's the webinar series that we hold almost every February. So if anybody is interested, especially those, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who are descended from Filipino ancestors, this, you know, if this interests you, you know where to find it. Soon. Well, we actually, yes. someone from the office is asking mm -hmm. you, Grace, what is the name of no your nonprofit? It's Tao Foundation. Tao, T A O, Foundation for Culture and Arts. Tao Foundation for Culture and Arts. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's very um, important to learn something with a body. You know, this is what I experience in my life as a singer. So here you learn with your hands, and it some that does something to you at least for some of us. <laughs> Wonderful. So let's move to some question from the audience. So we want to hear about cultural appropriation. And so if you want to go back and tell us more sure. about uh, that aspect, I sure. think it would be great. I was okay. just, uh, since I think your cultural work, it's very important. So I do want to make sure we mention it in this, uh, in this conversation. Okay. So um, different culture bearers in different communities have different, um, how do you say, policies for sharing knowledge, okay? So you cannot generalize. This, what I'm about to share with you now is one voice, okay? because there are others who would not share and you have to respect that. You cannot force these things. You have to respect if people don't want to share. 
Okay, here's what she said. This is um, Bae Maniaguya Lucy Rico. Um, and she told me in Visayan, and I translated to English. She said, and I quote, Indigenous peoples have been victims of different forms of colonization, educational, cultural, legal, etc. And because we have adopted many colonial ways, it is our responsibility to decolonize ourselves. Those of us who have mostly come to adopt the ways of the outside world and who now live outside of our ancestral domains, sometimes hastily react to things with no basis in tribal values. For example, they claim that indigenous knowledge systems and practices are not appropriate to share with others. In my view, commenting rashly on such an issue without first gaining in-depth understanding leads to the non-adherence to tribal values. To her, the tribe and to her to her community, the tribe is generous and loves peace. The tribes, the tribe shares with others, whether it be knowledge or material things. It is not that the tribe does not give, the tribe gives, but there is a process that one undergoes depending on what knowledge it is. The tribe gives, uh, if you want to learn a song, for example, you must go through a ritual to ask permission. The holder of that knowledge asks permission from the souls of ancestors who first lived and held such talent. One also asks permission from the spirit entrusted with such knowledge by God that is the source of everything. Such process of asking permission is our customary way and is done even by tribal members who wish to learn from those who possess knowledge. It is true that the tribe's generosity has been exploited, but exploitation is not our way, but the influence of the colonizer that has been adopted by those of us who also engage in exploitation. According to my father, if your neighbor does not share and you retaliate and do the same thing, you are helping to multiply such behavior, end quote. Again, this is one, uh, one view. You cannot use it to generalize, but if you want to learn things, you go to those who are willing to share. So that is one of the first things you have to know. Yeah, what is their policy for, share, for knowledge sharing? So there, in my experience, there are knowledges that can be shared and knowledges that cannot be shared. As for the knowledges that can be shared, you have to go through the process. And this is the, this is the customary way. And in recent years, I've also um, started to um, coordinate for my uh, latest activities with a state agency, the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. Okay, so that is the more bureaucratic way. Um, I hope that that answers the question. This is a very important question. That, like, for example, those those uh, in the webinars, those those elders are are very clear. They are going to share, and nobody will will be able to stop them. Thank you very much for sharing this voice, as you say, this perspective. I think it's um, it, it is very useful also to better understand the top context in which you operate and work. Uh, I think I will ask last question from the audience because uh, time is running, but I really, really encourage Larry, Eva and the others that I can see on the Q&A who ask questions to you to uh, maybe send the question over to me and I will forward them to Grace. Um, uh, and those of you who were shyer or, you know, just maybe didn't want to share or didn't have to anything to share right now or any question to ask, but might have them uh, after this event is over to be in contact with me uh, by email. And I will do my best uh, to either answer or forward these uh, questions with, to, um, to Grace. Um, so uh, I think that um, some of us are interested in the idea of, you, you were very eloquent in describing us how your ritual specialists and interlocutors think about uh, voice and healing. Uh, what is your experience? Uh, do you have anything to, to say about your own journey with your voice, um, going through the journey you just uh, spoke about uh, in terms of healing? Okay. Do we have time? Well, a couple of minutes. Uh, okay. I don't know whether okay. it will be. I don't know. All right. 
Okay. Okay. So, okay. So the, the, there is a, a deep relationality in the ritual specialist voice, right? So the question is, what about non-ritual specialists like us, you know, like me? Is my voice also relational? Now, the ethnomusicologist Martin Dautry wrote, and I agree with him, that the human voice is not the essence of a unitary self, but an instrument constructed in part through our mimetic, dialectic, dialogic, and polyphonic relationships with other voices that surround us from birth, through which our different personalities, our many overlapping selves, are projected out into the world. Now, also from the standpoint of many ritual specialists who I've engaged with, it is not only they who have spirit guides. They say that all of us do. It's just that the majority of us, according to them, do not actively communicate with our guides as they do. Now, what if any is a relationship between my singing with healing? Well, I have definitely sung to release my own stresses and to regain a better state of mind. But when I publicly sang, when I started to publicly sing the chants that were taught to me by different ritual specialists and healers, after I underwent rituals to seek permission, and after some of them, my, my teachers received guidance from their own source sources, um, sometimes through dreams on which song to teach to me, I have time and again heard audiences remark that when I sing, I seem to transform into something else other than my usual little self. I've wondered about what this meant because in my many years as a performer, I have never been physically inhabited by spirits. My lucidity has been a crucial component to my every performance. But perhaps what happens in these moments when my breathing is deeper than usual, my spine erect, my limbs free in movement, my mind relaxed, is perhaps my voice is increased in its ability to draw in and deliver energy, even command reality, as a voice directly emerging from relationships with other voices, both incarnate and discarnate. As several of my mentors have pointed out, human spirit connection does not only take place in mediumistic trance, that is when the spirit takes over the person's body and voice. Even when there is distance between human and spirit, inspiration and connection can still come through. The question is, but this connection amount to healing? I personally will not claim that, except perhaps to the extent that the momentary experience of heightened connection between seen and unseen forces addresses the condition of alienation that saturates much of our modern existence. As they say, to help connect is to help make whole, and to help make whole is to help heal. That what is a my wonderful. Thank you so much. What a wonderful uh, phrase to, to, to finish, uh, to end this conversation. I think it's really time to wrap up now. So thank you very, very much, Grace, for your participation and wonderful conversation. And thank you all for having been with us. Please stay tuned to the, on the activities of the CSWR, the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative and of Nauseologies. You can find all this information on the CSWR website um, linked uh, here in the chat box, including the registration link for our next Nauseologies event that will be on March 29th. It will be a conversation with anthropologist Susan Lepsalter on the resonance of unseen things, poetics, power, captivity, and UFOs in American Uncanny. So thank you for having me with us, and I wish you all a great rest of your day. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2023, President and Fellows of Harvard College.